Welcome to the CSLA MALA Virtual Congress. Bienvenue au Congrès virtuel de l'APC MALA. My name is Michelle Legault, and I'm the Executive Director of CSLA and LACF. Mon nom est Michelle Legault, et je suis la Directrice Générale de l'APC et de la FAPC. I'd like to begin today's Virtual Congress with a land acknowledgement. Please place your feet on the ground and take a breath. We acknowledge that we're gathering today from coast to coast to coast on the lands of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their governments. Though we're meeting virtually today, we acknowledge that the head office of the CSLA is in unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The head office of MALA is in Winnipeg, in Treaty 1 territory, the home and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Ininu, and Dakota peoples, and in the national homeland of the Red River Métis. We are thankful to work and live on these lands. Je voudrais commencer aujourd'hui par une reconnaissance des terres. Veuillez poser vos pieds sur le sol et respirer. Nous reconnaissons que nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui d'un océan à l'autre sur les terres des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis et de leur gouvernement. Nous nous réunissons virtuellement aujourd'hui et reconnaissons que le siège social de l'APC se trouve en territoire algonquin anishinab non cédé. Le siège de la Mala se trouve à Winnipeg, sur le territoire du traité numéro 1. Le foyer et les terres traditionnelles des Anishinab, des Ininou et des Dakota, ainsi que sur la patrie nationale des Métis de la Rivière Rouge. Nous sommes reconnaissants de travailler et de vivre sur ces terres. Merci. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Megan Hunter. On behalf of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects and the Manitoba Association of Landscape Architects, we'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us online for the virtual kickoff to the 2024 CSLA Congress. Hi, everyone. I'm Vanessa Jukstra. Megan and I are thrilled to be co-chairs and excited to see such a fantastic turnout today celebrating the theme Origins, Evolution, Revolution. This conference is a celebration of our profession's rich history, its continuous evolution, and the revolutionary ideas that are shaping the future of landscape architecture. From the fundamental origins of our practice to the ever-evolving trends and the potential for revolutionary change in our field, we are in for a truly inspiring Congress. We want to extend our deepest gratitude to the hard-working planning committee who has dedicated countless hours to curating an outstanding lineup of speakers, events, and tours. Their commitment to excellence is truly commendable. A special thanks to all our sponsors and contributors. We have a fantastic program lined up for you in here in Winnipeg. Our tours will showcase Manitoba's unique landscapes from the historic districts of Winnipeg to the Leaf and the transformative diversity gardens at Cinnabine Park. So be sure to check out the website for all of our tours. You will have a chance to meet your fellow attendees and make some new connections at the welcome reception held at Kamarok at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And of course, celebrate the 90 years of the CSLA and 50 years of the MALA. Our conference has an intriguing roster of esteemed speakers ready to share their knowledge and insights. And you'll be able to connect with industry professionals and explore the latest innovations of, at our trade show. Now, let's get started. We have an exciting virtual session ahead and we'll, that will both educate and inspire. See you in Winnipeg! Welcome to Maglin Site Furniture, a leading B2B manufacturer of outdoor amenities. Founded by President CEO Ian McCaskill in 1983, Maglin started in his Woodstock driveway and has since grown to its current headquarters on Innovation Way. We specialize in commercial grade outdoor furnishings like benches, waste and recycling receptacles, bike racks and more. In addition, we undertake custom manufacturing projects, both small and large scale. Our clientele includes design professionals such as landscape architects, architects, interior designers, and those managing outdoor spaces like parks, corporate campuses, and retail plazas. 
Our unique business model allows us to stay agile and responsive to our customers' needs. With in-house and external designers and engineers, we assemble and ship products from our Woodstock facility. Much of our component manufacturing is outsourced to local partners with whom we've built enduring relationships. But Maglin isn't just about business. We've integrated social consciousness into our operations, from supporting charitable causes to promoting diversity within our staff and striving for increasingly sustainable products and manufacturing processes. Sustainability is a core pillar of our business, and we're proud to be the first North American site furniture manufacturer to develop environmental product declarations. With an annual staff of almost 100 and a growing team of local summer students, we fostered a talented and fun-loving workforce. Many employees are approaching their 20th work anniversaries. In 2023, Maglin celebrates four decades of excellence, all from our Woodstock, Ontario base. Our commitment to high quality products and exceptional customer service has been our recipe for steady growth and success. What's the use? of worrying it never was worthwhile so pack up your troubles and relax a while and smile 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 hi thanks for inviting me to be with you here today c s l a to offer you this virtual commercial for my presentation at your conference on june the first my talk is called Humor, Resilience, and Change. And together we are going to look at managing stress, dealing with change, and using humor through all of that. Now, June the 1st is about five weeks away. So here are a few things that you can do starting today to manage your stress. First of all, let's start with breathing. So take in a nice, deep, breath of fresh air, and then breathe out all of the frustrations of a lifetime onto the shoulders of somebody in front of you. Stretching. Exercise. Yoga. <laughs> Well, that's about all the time we have. It was a pleasure being with you here today. Prenez bien soin de soi. Hello, uh, it's my pleasure to join you today. My name is Kofi Boone. I'm a professor of landscape architecture at North Carolina State University in the US, but I'm thrilled to be here and to participate in this really important conference and to share a few thoughts as a part of the keynote address. Uh, this is about recognition, reconciliation and reparation three topics that have charged many of us, uh, especially since the summer of 2020 in the United States, and may offer some guides as you all move forward with your very impressive agenda for this conference. As with you, we are facing uh, critical ecological challenges in the United States that face all of North America, wildfires of which unfortunately you all are very familiar, droughts, and the increasing impact of storms due to climate change. And we are rapidly trying to shift policy actions and the influence of landscape architects to be at the forefront of positive change that benefits communities and addresses these important challenges. A part of that has meant we can't just do it business as usual and just deploy technical skill sets uh, to new communities. We have to adjust how we deal with them. And this begins the recognition part of this conversation, recognizing where we are and how we operate. 
Uh, this is a map you may be familiar with from native land. It doesn't accurately depict all of the indigenous groups present in North America, but it starts to give a sense based on language groups what was here. And you can see in some cases it defies geography, it defies political boundaries. And uh, we also have come to recognize indigenous people as the great land stewards. Uh, only 5% of the human population right now are considered indigenous people. Yet where they are and with their practices, they manage 80% of the biodiversity on our planet. So recognizing traditional uh, traditions, engaging people authentically, uh, recognizing their connections to the land has become a part of this recognition phase where we are. And it's in the incredible uh, and uh, tragic story of land loss with indigenous people, particularly in the United States. These are the remaining uh, reservations and other places for indigenous people in our country. We know this is different in Canada, but from this standpoint, treaties, agreements, and respecting uh, the traditions of these people as we work together to solve these great challenges is a part of that recognition process. And where we are in the United States, and particularly where I am in the American South, uh, we have started to grapple with how to recognize uh, and learn from uh, the legacy of slavery. So this map shows the southern United States from 1860. It's a census map by county that indicates the percent population of enslaved African people. The darker the color, the more enslaved African people. Uh, it also works as a geology map because the darkest colors that you see along the Mississippi River and the Delta down to Louisiana, as well as hot spots along the eastern seaboard, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, up to Virginia, are were the richest soils here, uh, hence why they were identified as plantations for extractive economies. It's interesting that early in my career at NC State, over 20 years ago, uh, there was little to no mention of the legacy of plantations, the legacy of slavery, in terms of how we think of the land today. But it's a trauma, it's a history that's important for us to address. And in a Canadian context, uh, other legacies of the oppression of people uh, the uh, unfair treatment of people in their geographies are increasingly important, especially as we deal with climate change and adaptation. Also, in the United States, not unlike the dispossession of land of indigenous people, the dispossession of land of black people, of African Americans, people of African descent. Right after the end of our American Civil War, uh, African Americans went out and acquired property across the United States and tried to establish a living. Uh, all of that was disrupted through policy, which will come up a bit later in this conversation with regards to helping governments and policymakers understand the value of landscape and its relationship to people to meet these pressing challenges, ecological and human. This is a map of land loss in the United States. And what's highlighted is uh, in red uh, is land that was lost uh, most severely in terms of wealth, uh, $8.1 billion of land loss in North Carolina alone. Uh, and really an untold amount of understanding of land. Uh, land ownership and land tenure is a very contentious topic, which probably deserves its own conversation. But needless to say, the detachment of people from the land processes, meaning whenever we're faced with making decisions as landscape architects, the conspicuous absence of some people of color from that decision making isn't just new and isn't just based on your interpersonal relationships, but there's a legacy of harm. Uh, that we need to acknowledge and recognize before we can move forward. And also in the United States, but not specific to the United States, is this phenomenon that we call racialized topography. Uh, going back to land ownership and land tenure, uh, most of the high ground and the most uh, arable land uh, in our history was claimed by either colonists or plantation owners. And uh, other folks, marginalized people, were relegated to areas that were more challenging. This is a diagram from our own city in Raleigh, where North Carolina State is located, showing the location of the state capital intentionally placed on high ground between two creek beds. What's important to note is at the time that Raleigh was founded, we still had legal slavery in the United States, and African Americans in many places, including Raleigh, were not allowed to own property within the formal city boundaries. And so in order to participate economically, they had to self-build on the edges of established communities, usually in floodplains and low-lying areas. This phenomenon is not specific to Raleigh. It's a Southeastern United States phenomenon known as racialized topography. That is the correlation 
between altitude and race, higher elevations being predominantly white and wealthy, lower elevations in our area being predominantly marginalized people, black and brown and low income communities. And this, of course, created a trajectory that puts those communities at the highest risk for flooding and other climate related events. And the combination of these factors, the ecological factors and social factors, uh, increase the burden and the risk uh, to communities uh, disproportionately. A uh, recent article from the New York Times that focuses on the eastern uh, seaboard of the United States, and particularly North Carolina, uh, on the screen you see the incredible system of rivers, creeks, and streams that define our state, uh, and also define the flood risk ecologically uh, that people face in our own home place overlaid with social vulnerabilities, so communities that are facing extreme poverty, uh, lower health and life outcomes, lower access to health care and food, transportation, infrastructure, uh, these overlay pretty consistently and combine to make communities that are also facing long-term chronic social vulnerability uh, risks, short-term uh, acute risks like exposure to flood, exposure to hurricanes, exposure to other ecological risks. It's the combination of the two that is really a part of this recognition phase. And so these are all tools that we can begin to apply and use in our own work to make sense of some very difficult and challenging uh, situations that we're facing in the 21st century. We also have to note that landscape architects have not been neutral. Our profession and the built environmental professionals have not been neutral in the face of a lot of these changes. Uh, as much as we elevate and celebrate, and a matter of fact, two years ago was the birthday of Frederick Olmsted, who popularized the profession of landscape architecture, uh, probably most famous for the design of Central Park in New York, which you can see on the right. Uh, it's important to note that Central Park itself, which popularized the public park movement and many other influential things that we still benefit from today as a profession, uh, was built on former uh, freedmen's villages and other uh, free communities. Uh, and the image on the left, Seneca Village, a self-built free community founded and run by nearly a thousand African-Americans that was erased in the construction of Central Park. So there is some complicity uh, with us with regards to uh, deploying what we think are benefits from the landscape architecture standpoint in the face of social inequality and the inability for communities to define themselves. And even in my hometown of Detroit, uh, this image of Hastings Street, uh, the business street of Detroit for the black community during the days of segregation and what was known as Black Bottom uh, in the 20th century uh, experienced uh, complete erasure due to federal highways, urban renewal, and again, policies. And so I'm gonna bring this up a few times that the ability to provide evidence and recognition can inform better policy decisions moving forward. We're actually engaged in our country and the Reconnecting Communities Program through our Department of Transportation to come back and find ways to heal these wounds uh, that were done intentionally through design in the 20th century. And it's important to note is this quote indicates from Chris Dameret that although there is an increasing appetite to deal with uh, adapting to climate change, putting resources in for infrastructure improvements and land use transformations, we have to be mindful that we don't want to recreate the exact same disparities that we faced before we started. And so uh, this is how we move to reconciliation, this idea that we need to find situations where we have recognized that harms have been done. Uh, we are in the process of healing those particular harms. We need to reconcile that and landscape architects and designers play a critical role. This is an example of uh, that kind of reconciliation at the scale of the site uh, and regional phenomena that are specific to the United States, but again, could have broader implications globally. Uh, the uh, journal on the left, the book on the right, are both from my colleague Ellen Deming and I, who have been looking at Confederate monuments and Confederate narratives, uh, which sadly have taken new traction uh, in the past few years in our country. Uh, but really have shaped our public environment to the point where celebrating the stories of what was known as the lost cause has suppressed local narratives of other people's stories and really challenged their sense of belonging. And in the summer of 2020, at least in our country, and in fact, other parts of the world, uh, the statues, the memorials, the places dedicated to honoring colonial leaders, honoring Confederate leaders, 
uh, were the targets of mass action. They were torn down, even in my hometown of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, citizens came and tore down the Confederate monuments as a show of protest and a show of resistance against what they thought were unfair forces. Well, it turns out these places are all around us. The streets that are named after people, uh, the public places, the squares, uh, the institutions, the, pub the, the other elements. And so the article on the left was a German uh, journal uh, that uh, we published an initial article in uh, that talked about this phenomenon globally. And then this book, uh, Empty Pedestals, uh, through LSU Press coming out in June, uh, talks about not just identifying this pattern, but what have designers done to address it and to start to create these places that could facilitate healing and reconciliation. A few of the examples that we cite, uh, this one, for example, in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, uh, where famously uh, Mayor Mitch Landrieu took down all of the Confederate monuments uh, in the center city uh, uh, overnight uh, and issued a an address that we got permission to republish in the book about why, how it was doing lasting harm and it was suppressing the kind of social cohesion and the belonging that was required for us to prepare socially and culturally for the transformations to come. Uh, the Paper Monuments Project, which was headed by uh, Brian Lee uh, and Sue Mobley, uh, which in the places of former Confederate monuments, uh, uh, convening local people, having conversations in situ on the site, uh, to bubble up stories that were suppressed because of the dominant narrative that was suppressing it, the Confederate narrative dedicated to a general or, or another leader, uh, turning those stories into uh, simple graphic formats, paper, uh, hence the name, uh, graphic production, and then bubbling those up into ideas for new ways of honoring those folks, uh, either celebrating local people, traditions, rituals, to reactivate those public spaces and build the social cohesion that we know is required for social resilience. In this example, uh, uh, by Dayton Schrader, uh, this monument is mobile, and it talks about not just those long-standing stories, uh, but contemporary ones. So this memorial is a visualization of data that tracks uh, the police murder of African-Americans and Black people over a period of time. It's a three-dimensional occupiable graph for a lot of way, better way of describing it with information printed on the floor. The mobility of it talks about the ubiquitous nature of this particular injustice. And so you can see it uh, located on the National Mall of Washington, DC. Uh, it was invited by the community to be at Tulsa, Oklahoma to honor the tragic destruction of the Greenwood District uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, the idea that we can use these as, as devices and spaces as places to reconcile with uh, some of these harms that were done in the interest of building social cohesion. Or here uh, at Sycamore Hill Baptist Church, which was destroyed during our era of urban redevelopment and urban renewal, an African-American church in an African-American district uh, that was intentionally destroyed through policy uh, for redevelopment. Uh, its last uh, anchor, uh, an institution, this church, uh, being uh, not recreated, but the spirit of it and its marking as a place uh, redesigned uh, by uh, Zena Howard and the folks at Perkins and Will uh, to again, allow the community to have that place, to have the conversations, to talk about the history of what occurred, but not just to stay there, but to move forward and figure out how new bounds can be forged. All of these are examples of landscapes that help with reconciliation. With regards to moving from reconciliation to reparation, repair, reparative work and repair of harm done, it's important to reflect on where we've been, at least in the 20th century, so that when we move into now the, firmly into the 21st century and forward, we're looking at alternative models to increase the power of local people to participate in the decision making and the implementation of these resilient strategies. And so it's important as an academic, to be honest with you, to re remind you of this, the uh, ladder of public participation made popular in the 1960s, Sherry Arnstein's work, uh, and where we are as a profession in terms of how we reward our engagement with communities, what resources we bring to bear, do we source those sufficiently, what time frames are we working on to build community trust, retain it, and translate those into tangible outcomes that really benefit communities. Uh, this was sort of a baseline. And so, you know, a lot of our work falls, you know, in the middle of the ladder in terms of consulting with communities that are in need, informing them, 
but really moving them and preparing communities to actually take a leadership role and and making things happen a lot of that deals with governance and policy and really requiring people to do that as a part of their work and also resourcing it uh, finding ways to create enough resources to hold those communities together with designers with landscape architects and with other disciplines such that you have the time frame required so that there's proper capacity building done there's preparation that allows people to move to next steps in my own home state in an hour away from where i live now uh was one of the places uh, that really forced that conversation in our own backyard. Uh, Warren County in 1982 uh, was one of the uh, important uh, birthplaces of the modern so, uh, environmental justice movement uh, where civil rights nonviolent direct action tactics were deployed uh, to resist a PCB landfill that was planned for their community because it was targeted because it was poor and black. Uh, they were unsuccessful in preventing the PCB landfill from being targeted, but academics came and supported and documented what was happening. Uh, and it became, uh, and a few years later, uh, this report, Toxic Waste and Race in the United States, through really the first environmental justice report that provided quantitative data showing the correlation between race and proximity to toxics. And in the United States in 1987, and continuing, the greatest predictor of your exposure to hazardous waste and toxics is race, above income, education level, and other forms of mobility. So this report was essential to starting to create the evidence base that led to the creation of the U.S. Uh, office of Environmental Justice, now housed within the White House and the President's office, uh, that is now deploying billions of dollars in infrastructure reinvestment uh, meant to address some of these harms. But what's important about it is in addition to the mapping and the quantitative side of showing these correlations that then uh, fuel resources was the proposal of an alternative engagement model, which was here. Uh, former Congressman Harold Mitchell of South Carolina uh, faced with the an environmental justice community around the Arkwright factory and uh, black communities and low-income communities around this decaying uh, Superfund Brownfield site, uh, their inability to organize, to advocate in common for policy to transform uh, Spartanburg uh, initiated the regenesis process. And through that process of really authentic community engagement a long period of time, created the model you see before you, the collaborative problem solving model, which in our country uh, is required uh, for people to participate in Environmental Protection uh, Act and environmental justice grants. So uh, really a seven step process where communities are required to co-create at every step and co-evaluate between steps, uh, uh, every step in the decision-making process. So this model is something that we use as a baseline and that we're trying to innovate beyond as we deal with the challenges of climate and biodiversity loss. Again, in our own backyard, some work that we've been engaged with since 2016 uh, when Hurricane Matthew hit North Carolina and devastated communities in the eastern part of our state. Uh, one of those communities was Princeville, North Carolina. It was the first town founded by free African-Americans in the United States, founded as Freedom Hill in 1865 uh, and later as uh, Princeville in 1885, built on the banks of the Tar River. As we talked about racialized topography in the past, the only land available to African Americans at that time was in a floodplain uh, prone to repetitive flooding and devastating flooding in its history. Uh, many of the black and white pictures that you see here are buildings that no longer exist due to uh, repetitive flooding and flood damage. The color pictures indicate the level of engagement that we've been uh, dealing with uh, almost for 10 years now. Uh, this before and after, uh, which is a little bit shocking for some people, shows the inundation that occurred in 2016, this was the sixth major flood in United States parlance, uh, a 500 year flood it means every year there's a half of a percent chance that you get inundated uh, with this amount of water. Uh, in the case of Princeville, uh, this has happened six times uh, since its construction. So it gives you a sense of the real harm that all of these policies, decisions uh, have, have, have produced. Uh, we engaged with it in an authentic process that was workshop driven uh, after people had a chance to uh, uh, deal with the immediate crisis of losing their home places, losing track of their relatives and other things. How do we co-create the identification of the issues that need to be addressed and strategies that came from that? 
Uh, just a couple of brief stories before we close. Uh, the cover image of this presentation is also this image where one of the first things that we did uh, after the devastation of the flood uh, was identify the assets of the community. And one of them was the story. Most people had no idea that Princeville had the significant history that it did. And so we identified a youth group that was Princeville based. Uh, we developed a tour route where they could talk about the history of the town and key locations in this location along the Tar River, the last navigable point for boats coming south from Virginia with enslaved African people. Those people had to disembark smaller boats, be rowed to shore where these folks, young folks are standing and then walk uh, to the auction block to be sold several miles away. So this was the beginning of the tour. And even at that point, it talked about that intersection of ecological and social factors. Uh, for the young people that were involved in that tour, we invited in the campus and we talked about as landscape architects, how we start to translate in information into tools that we can use to not just analyze the situation, but propose uh, new solutions and new ideas. And so we challenged this group of young people, a bunch of teenagers, with new tools to start to visualize and communicate how they might interpret uh, some of these rich stories. One of the outcomes of this was a mobile museum. It was an idea of one of the kids that came through Princeville and said, well, I wish that there was a place I could tell us the history of this particular place, but I wish we could move it, right? So when a storm came or a, or a, or a hurricane came, we could kind of hitch this museum up to a truck and we could drive it away. It sounded like an offhanded comment, but it turned out through a lot of collaboration with the university. And I would say in this sort of uh, recognition, reconciliation, reparation process, institutions have an important place to play, an important role to play, because we can be patient, right? As long as we can uh, sustain our um, uh, educational research missions, we can establish partnerships, very long standing partnerships with communities that in some cases private industry can't. So these partnerships become really important. But this mobile museum was built by the Architecture Design Build Studio in eight weeks. Uh, it exists in Princeville. It's used for festivals. It has a gallery showing it now. Uh, you can see it's a, it's an actual billboard, you know, that's, that celebrates and advertises uh, Princeville's history as a part of that. Another one, so this starts to get to the policy side, uh, the small incremental activities of Princeville made a case for reinvestment, in this case, uh, in their elementary school, which was completely renovated after the devastating floods of Hurricane Matthew, but through partnership with the Coastal Dynamics Design Lab, led by a colleague, Andy Fox, uh, transformation of that landscape into places that help young people learn about resilience. And so in this case, rain gardens uh, that, that are being established that deal with uh, not the full flood, but with smaller incremental rains. And through the uh, partnerships at the federal level, uh, Youth Conservation Corps uh, that cleared and identified and marked heritage trails, the walks that those young people did in previous slides into formal infrastructure, and they were all paid uh, for their time. Concurrent to that, more of the work that we do in landscape architecture broadly, how do we really reanalyze and visualize the possibilities of landscapes that are going to be facing huge decisions in the future through climate adaptation? And so here through the Coastal Dynamics Design Lab, again, led by Andy Fox, a colleague here, uh, how do we go lot by lot, property by property in this town of Princeville to identify which places can be rebuilt, which places shouldn't, and for the places that shouldn't be rebuilt, what are alternative uses that can add value to the community, ranging from food production to recreation to nature preserves to wetland management? Uh, this really opened the eyes of a lot of organizations about how to deal with climate adaptation. And that gave evidence base for a partnership with the Conservation Trust for North Carolina and the Princeville Collaborative. And through the Conservation Trust, they've now taken this process that was innovated in Princeville across the state to other communities that are dealing with climate adaptation. So landscape architects through our work at the site scale connects to broader ideas of policy making, which then attracts partners and funders, and then allows uh, things that grew up from the ground up with uh, grassroots leadership uh, to influence broader policies. Other benefits as we come to the end of this is that momentum also led to other infrastructure. With landscape architects, we often think about bricks and mortar, uh, dirt and soil and plants and really our, our non-human friends. But we know that the health of that part of the world also requires health and social side. And so the birth of Freedom Org, the first nonprofit uh, founded in Princeville that enables this group led by young people from Princeville 
uh, to participate in the philanthropic community, and they've been very successful with that. Uh, farm tours, the ability for communities to also build the social systems required to, res to maintain cultural and social resilience. Uh, so this one with local farmers around Princeville uh, doing their own events uh, to attract attention, to give a sense of return to people who are affected by these communities. Uh, the bike ride, they have a, a, a century bike ride, which is attended by hundreds of people from across the East Coast uh, to increase the visibility of these places. And again, many different opportunities for local businesses and local folks uh, to self-direct compatible conservation-oriented activities. To reach the end of this conversation, moving from the broad imperative uh, through recognition, reconciliation, and now dealing with repair, reparative work uh, of the harm done, uh, the Just Communities Protocol, which is a unique combination of Partnership for Southern Equity and what was once known as Eco Districts. So this ability to weave together racial mm -hmm. equity issues with sustainability and governance at the community scale has just issued this Just Communities Protocol, which is an attempt uh, to start to give people more tools as they start to take this on in their own communities. Uh, the four key components, the groundwork, so building relationships with communities uh, so that your work is not extractive. Uh, governance, so how do we make decisions in a democratic way that helps people figure it out. The roadmap, so giving people kind of benchmarks to hit that show that they're making progress. And of course, implementation, because without implementation, it doesn't really add uh, value to many communities. And again, some words that we usually never hear when we have these conversations. How do we fuel a sense of belonging? How do we create senses of opportunity? How do we focus on well-being and really joy, not just health, but joy, like people are thriving and they feel great about their places? Mobility, how do we make sure that people can move as they will? And of course, grounded environment. Environment is number one. Uh, with regards to our work. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I wish for you all a great conference. Thank you so much, Kofi. That was really interesting. Um, just want everybody to, uh, a quick reminder to send us your questions by chat or by Q&A. Um, we have a, a, a little bit of time to address a few questions. Um, I know I'm always, um, you know, inspired to hear really how this impact, uh, the impact of this profession has on social justice um, and on really contributing to so, so many of our societal problems today. So um, it was great to hear from you that um, that sentiment is shared south of the border as well. Um, so we have uh, one question that has come in here from Christina. Um, she says, it's exciting that your work engages so many youth in the community partnerships. Are you seeing any themes emerging or patterns with what youth are imagining for future landscapes and spaces that mark historical narratives? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, with regards to patterns, and it's a little bit unfair because I have two children, so I have two teenagers in my own uh, backyard that I, I experiment on from time to time. Um, I think that uh, the work that provides uh, a short-term way for them to see the effects of what they're doing. Um, uh, so many young people are engaged in social media and in digital work. And, and I don't know about Canada, but we here have started to pick up on a little bit of climate anxiety in young people in terms of not seeing a way forward or a pathway that will produce a better future. So finding ways to engage young people in activities that produce almost immediate results, that gives a little bit of immediate gratification. So physical, tangible things, which, you know, as an example, the young folks worked on the trail development uh, as mundane as some people may see that as, you know, the fact that I put in this amount of work and at the end of that, I can actually see and use and share the benefits of what I'm done. Those small moments mean a lot. So that would be a recommendation is to try and build into whatever processes you're dealing with the young people, sort of tangible short-term benefits that continue to entice them to keep moving towards uh, bigger, bigger goals.
I'm sorry, you're on of mute. Course, I can't. I just realized I'm muted. <laughs> um, it's only been three years of virtual. <laughs> but um, that actually picked up on a question that I had as well, which was what the strategies that landscape architects use to get involved with grassroots organizations or community projects, um, especially when the project, uh, the public maybe is not often aware of the benefits of the profession has on influencing social and environmental change. So, you know, on top of the, those youth strategies, do you have any other um, suggestions or recommendations uh, to address that? Yeah, I think uh, just writ large uh, with community engaged work, I'd recommend uh, finding a way to be invited to work with the community. And in which case, when uh, some communities start to talk about their issues, they're not aware of our profession, they're not aware of our expertise, but they're aware of the things that we impact and that we help. Uh, so uh, protection uh, from harms, including flood risk and uh, and climate related things, uh, empowering and enabling health, like creating spaces that encourage people to get physical activity. They may not know that there are professions that are specifically associated with those, but that becomes sort of a common vocabulary to say that, you know, our goals and interests are the same as theirs. And we just have this particular technical skill set that can help with that. So uh, in lieu of an invitation, it would be you know, uh, just being active civically, you know, uh, either in your community and other organizations uh, and just sort of listening. You know, that's always really the first uh, rule with all community engagement is not going in, for example, with an elevator pitch or a speech about all the things that you can do, but to kind of be present and listen and take in what's happening and then be able to respond. Uh, so there, there are different ways of doing it, but those are the ways that, that we've had some success with. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. So listen and then get involved. Good advice indeed. So we're going to go to the second presentation now. I just want to thank Kofi. Um, it was a fascinating presentation. Um, and uh, I will welcome to listen into the rest of the conference. Um, and if anybody has any other questions, you can always email me um, and I can forward those questions to Kofi as well. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll go on to a presentation now by Colleen Mercer Clark a former CSLA president and the founding chair of our Committee on Climate Adaptation. I'll leave it to you, Colleen. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the crisis in biodiversity, what IFLA is doing and what landscape architects should be doing and why it all matters. Biodiversity refers to all the kinds of life that make up our natural world. Everything from diversity in DNA, diversity within species, diversity between species, and the diversity of ecosystems. Biodiversity is dependent on an intricate web of biological, chemical, physical, and living systems, all of which are delicately balanced, they're nested together, and they're interdependent, spatially, temporally, and functionally. Biodiversity across the globe and in tiny spaces is now declining faster than any time in human history. Globally, natural ecosystems have declined by 47%, 25% of species are threatened with extinction, and the biomass of wild mammals has fallen by 82%. The past five years have been a challenge. By 2019, we'd pretty much accepted that our world was warming, climates were shifting, and extreme weather was becoming the new norm. Then our lives were disrupted by the COVID pandemic, which changed pretty much how we lived and how we worked. However, the challenges posed by COVID, by recessions, by even by climate change, will all soon pale when compared to the threats posed by this fast approaching collapse of biodiversity in all countries on all landscapes. In the 70s, when I was working as an ecologist, the great Canadian songwriter Joni Mitchell warned us all that we were paving paradise and putting up a parking lot, pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hotspot. Joni was right then, and she's unfortunately still right today. We are still cutting the forests, filling the wetlands, and scraping off the topsoil. We've hardened our coastlines, destroyed habitats, and condemned too many species to extinction. We've pumped emissions into the air and into the water 
to dissipate. For too long, human society has continued to see nature as something to be conquered and shaped to serve humankind. Nature is now suffering, and nature holds our best hope for a better future. In addition to human stresses, nature is now exposed to challenges posed by the warming world. Increasingly severe weather, wildfires, extremes of heat and cold, drought. Flood. Global warming is already changing delicately balanced planetary systems. It's changing things faster than nature can cope. This figure outlines the targets for sustainability of ecosystems and habitats, the thresholds past which stress will damage ecosystem function, and the tipping points of no return. Past these tipping points and deterioration in biodiversity and system functioning will occur, and there's nothing we can do to slow or to stop the degradation. Systems will fail. Global warming has a tipping point of 1.5 degrees Celsius, above where global mean temperatures would normally sit. After that, global, national, and local systems start to change dramatically. We were on a path to hit that tipping point by 2030. We actually hit that tipping point in the latter half of 2023. We are already at a point where lights and sirens should start to go off. But is anybody really paying attention? Let's talk about how we, as landscape architects throughout the world, we are paying attention. The International Federation of Landscape Architects is the global voice of our profession. It was founded on the UN model in 1947. IFLA World Council is comprised of 78 national association members, of which the CSLA is one. IFLA works through five world regions, Europe, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the Americas. Each of these regions send volunteer landscape architects like myself, to work together on global issues of importance to the profession. Your colleagues have been working tirelessly on sustainability, climate change, and biodiversity since before 2017. IFLA's current president, Bruno Marx of New Zealand, has been working his butt off crossing the globe to establish partnerships and MOUs with allied international organizations who are also working on ecosystem sustainability, human health, green global cities, cultural landscapes, and many other critical issues. One of the international agencies working to find practical ways to advance sustainability is the IUCN, a collaboration of governments and civil society that's providing the rationale for a new approach to living with nature. The IUCN relies on the best efforts of 15,000 volunteer scientists and experts, again, people like me, from diverse disciplines to assess priority needs and to work, provide workable solutions to many crises. The IUCN works not only on the conservation of nature, but also on the betterment of urban environments and on the security of food and water. In 2019, IFLA became an international NGO member of the IUCN. You may all be familiar with the COPS on climate change, the Conference of the Parties, where supporting nations gather to discuss, to develop, and to support agreed to plans for action. In December of 2022, these nations met in Montreal at the COP15 on biodiversity. IFLA and the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects partnered with IUCN colleagues to present a new view on how together we could advance conservation and transform society. COP15 produced the Kunming Montreal Bio Global Biodiversity Framework. The GBF establishes 23 completely achievable targets for action, all of which have relevance to our profession and to our ethics, but targets 11, 12, and 14 speak, I believe, specifically to things we as professionals can do and in many situations have already been doing. Target 11 asks nations, organizations, communities, and individuals to work to restore, to maintain, and to enhance nature's contributions to people through the application of ecosystem-based approaches and nature-based solutions. Target 12 pushes us all to increase the area, the quality, the connectivity of, the access to, and the benefits of green and blue spaces in densely populated areas. Target 14 sheds light on the need to create enabling policy that supports rather than restricts efforts to transform society and environment. 
This one, I believe, is really important. We need more landscape architects working at all levels of government to advance the needed policy for the transformative change we all know is possible and responsible. So why should Canadians care? Why should we care? Canada is one of 20 countries that holds 94% of the world's remaining wilderness. We are number two on that list. We have 28% of the boreal forest, 20% of the freshwater, and 24% of the wetlands. We have the longest marine coastline in the world. We have tons of wilderness. Don't get proud. I popped up the second half. We have lost 70% of our prairie grasslands and over 90% of our eastern grasslands. We have lost 80% of our Carolinian forest. We have destroyed eight, over 80% of the wetlands in and around heavily populated areas. We're not doing any better than anyone else. I want to step across political borders for, for a minute and look at our world from an ecologist pr perspective. This is how land species in the Americas move. You'll notice these migrations are predominantly north and south following our seasons. And for marine species, our large oceanic currents. As our landscapes and oceans warm and conditions change, animals seeking relief are anticipated to move toward cooler areas. They'll try to escape up mountains. They will come north to us. Moving through developed landscapes like the eastern seaboard of Canada and the United States, how will they find safe passage and sustainable habitat on their journeys? How can they avoid us, find homes with us, be protected by us? Even without climate-related migration, biodiversity in Canada is already threatened. The figure on the left illustrates where species and habitats are most at risk in our country. The second image illustrates land use in Canada, land use like urbanization, transportation, agriculture, industry, as well as the ongoing habitat destruction associated with forestry and degradation uh, of wetlands. All of these things put intense pressure on ecosystems. Now, you might say again, in fact, many keep saying this, no worries. Look at all that land in blue that's still relatively wild. Protecting our remaining wild spaces is really, really important. Don't mistake me, but please look at where some of our biggest challenges are on the lands and waters that we occupy, on the landscapes we have altered, on the developed lands and waters of Canada. This is why us, this is why landscape architects, because we are at work on those developed landscapes. And we understand why work at all spatial scales is important to biodiversity. Biodiversity, as I said, functions from those microscopic genetic scales, the DNA, across the species, the habitats, the ecosystems. And to fully understand biodiversity, to make a real difference, we need to value nature in every space at all those scales that matter. Every piece of nature we protect, we create, we sustain is an integral part of moving nature back into our landscapes. Landscape architects already work at all the scales that matter, from the large landscapes that provide clean air and clean water to the tiny, tiny inner city spaces and pieces of green. We understand how change affects all scales, and we understand where human society fits. We know that even those little urban pocket pieces can be linked together to provide important ecological corridors as well as supportive green spaces for human well-being. Our profession has always played a significant role in protecting, in restoring, and in sustaining the nature we have and the nature we have lost. All across this country, communities are restoring previously degraded landscapes, whether industrial or urban, deforested or farmed. We can be more innovative, more technically creative creative. Working with other disciplines and with academia and community, we can create infrastructure that actually lives within nature. We have so much work to do creating better developed landscapes and fixing the ones we have already destroyed. And it's not just about spaces, it's also about processes. Urban centers that are rethinking how we deal with cloud precipitation resulting from more severe weather are also thinking about how can we capture and reuse precipitation like in a sponge city, the opposite of gray infrastructure that seeks to move water away as fast as possible. 
Questions are being asked. Why is agriculture not an ecosystem-based process? Why does transportation mostly ignore the environment through which it moves? How can humans live better with the land and the water, not just on it? Business as usual is still the dominant practice in most of our world. Landscape architects, planners, ecologists continue to face barriers and opposition to new ways of thinking and to the changes necessary to implement nature-based solutions. In many communities and organizations, existing policies and practices can actually actively work against a new approach to nature. Low-bid tendering processes that began in the 80s have ensured that planners and designers do not often have the time to be either creative or innovative. When you attend the CSLA Congress in May, Jane Walsh has a session on addressing these and other challenges in the City of Toronto as it grapples with its stewardship responsibilities for the natural environment. Don't miss it. It's become increasingly clear that the old ways are not the good ways. Somewhat ironically, this has been clear to leaders of our profession for over 50 years. In 1969, Ian was encouraging us to design with nature. Cornelia believed in the art of the possible. She believed we must love every leaf. Working with nature may be our only practical pathway to a sustainable future and the best hope for society struggling today with severe weather and conflict. Ecosystem-based planning, design, and adaptation, it can be difficult to sell, complex to achieve, and important to maintain. Successful implementation is almost always the result of interdisciplinary teams and partnerships and relationships with a community who can and will ensure the project is funded and supported into the future. This is our time. These are our challenges. They are large challenges and they require of us transformative innovation. Our world and our communities depend on us to provide leadership for the future, not to follow in the mistaken paths of our past. Thanks so much for your kind attention today, and I do hope you have some questions. Thank you so much, Colleen. Fascinating. Um, please send in your questions as a reminder through the chat or the Q&A function. You, Colleen, as you were speaking, one of the things that we were thinking of um, and the chat, uh, the staff was chatting about is, you know, with all this accelerated housing development, you know, often the policies are not really considering or focusing on the environment. And one of the questions I have for you is, you know, how can landscape architects make the argument uh, for protecting and enhancing biodiversity in projects at all scales in the face of sometimes um, you know, economic reasons that uh, may not support that. I'm wondering what, uh, you know, I guess we're talking about strategies today, but what are your strategies uh, for landscape architects, your top two uh, strategies, if you had them? Oh, we'll get you to unmute, Colleen. Oh, and all of a sudden we can't hear Colleen. We could hear you before. <laughs> nope, we have no audio for Colleen. All right. I'm going to rejig and see if she that... is. <laughs> there we go. Sometimes you just have to pull the plug out and put it in again. That's right. Um, there, there aren't really two top strategies. And, and that's a good thing. Because as uh, Kofi was saying earlier, there's so much that needs to be done and so many different pathways that we can evoke change. Um, I, I will keep emphasizing, I think it's important for all our educators out there who are listening, that yes, we need really innovative design and transformative design, but we also need young people who have been through our level of training and have our ethics to look for future jobs in other decision-making roles. And I, I cannot emphasize strongly enough, policy writing and speaking speaking truth to decision-makers, makers, trans, translating science, what we know to what we do, to people who are perhaps not as engaged as we are, is really important. But look at the work that we've done as landscape architects in the country. I mean, if you just look at the restoration projects going on in the city, 
of Toronto. Um, if if you look at what happened in Ontario, when a, an economically focused current government wanted to do more development in our green belt, um, that it was the partnership and the outcry. I think not just from the community in itself, but also from the professions that really caused a lot of those decisions to be rolled back. But we need to be active in and in, in that that dialogue and we need to start yesterday on that. So it's not it's not enough to just stay in the design lab. It it's really important as, as Kofi was saying, it's really important to be part of the community that we seek to serve. And it's really important that they know what we can bring and the skill set that we have to offer. Thank you. Too many very people much, I think that, that also answers another question that Dar uh, Darcy had about how we can come together as a unified profession to affect this kind of change. And I think the listening and the getting involved, short of getting landscape architects elected to every political post in the country, uh, you know, which is another strategy that I think we've been advocating for a while. Um, but thank you very much, Colleen. This was so interesting. And uh, we'll be, I'm sure everybody will be sure to catch up sort of the follow up uh, to this at Congress um, in Jane's presentation uh, in Winnipeg. Thank you very much. La prochaine présentation est par Catherine Auger. And just as a reminder to our um, Anglophone participants, this presentation will be in French. Um, and so you can use the Wordly app, um, which was shared earlier, um, and listen uh, to the presentation or read the presentation captions in English or the language of your choice. So I'll hand it over to Catherine's presentation. Um, and we'll have more time for questions as well. Thank you. Bonjour, je m'appelle Catherine et aujourd'hui, je vais vous présenter le Jardin de bord de mer, vivre avec un littoral en transition un projet de Practice Landscape avec qui je collabore depuis 2021. J'ai grandi à Montréal où j'ai obtenu ma maîtrise en architecture à l'Université McGill en 2020. C'est aussi à travers cette maîtrise où j'ai été initiée à l'architecture du paysage par Rosetta S. Elkin et Marielle Collard. J'ai par la suite décidé de me rediriger vers l'architecture du paysage et puis d'y faire une maîtrise à Harvard University que j'ai terminée en mai dernier. Depuis, je suis au National Park Service à Washington, D.C., en plus de continuer à travailler à temps partiel pour Practice Landscape. En 2022 et 2023, j'ai été la chargée de projet pour les Jardins de bord de mer à Sainte-Flavie, où j'ai développé une profonde affection pour cette région. Practice Landscape est une firme axée sur la compréhension du passé avec un profond respect pour l'avenir, qui souhaite collaborer avec des clients qui partagent une éthique de travail similaire quant au territoire et à son aménagement. Nous désirons plus que jamais travailler avec des partenaires partageant un désir commun de développer un aménagement adapté à son environnement. Nous prenons une approche globale en faisant nos propres recherches, dessins, plantations et travaux. Cette façon de travailler nous permet d'apprendre de l'environnement vivant avec lequel nous travaillons, d'en découvrir sa beauté, d'en comprendre ses processus existants et conséquemment d'envisager des écologies futures de façon novatrice en favorisant la collaboration entre les communautés. Aujourd'hui, j'ai le plaisir de partager notre expérience de recherche, de conception et d'installation d'une série de jardins dans le Québec rural, le Jardin de bord de mer. Ces jardins abordent les conséquences des changements climatiques le long du fleuve Saint-Laurent qui obligent de plus en plus les communautés locales à s'éloigner du littoral. Ce projet est l'extension d'un livre intitulé « Landscapes of Retreat » écrit par Rosetta S. Elkin. Ce dernier explore plusieurs cas de retraite des paysages ne pouvant plus soutenir de logements permanents. Il est disponible gratuitement sur landscapesofretreat.com. En 2022 et 2023, deux sites de jardins de bord de mer ont été conçus et installés par une équipe de Practice Landscape et les Jardins Métis en collaboration avec la municipalité de Sainte-Flavie grâce au généreux soutien financier du Fonds de solidarité FTQ et de TELUS. Ces jardins sont les précurseurs d'une série de nombreux jardins similaires le long du littoral du fleuve Saint-Laurent. Pour vous aider à comprendre le contexte, en 2010, les plus hautes marées jamais enregistrées dans le Bas-Saint-Laurent ont sérieusement endommagé plusieurs maisons construites directement sur les rives du fleuve Saint-Laurent. De nombreux propriétaires ont conséquemment été contraints de déplacer leurs maisons plus loin du fleuve, avec l'aide des municipalités qui sont devenues responsables des terrains ainsi abandonnés en bordure du fleuve. 
Avec nos collaborateurs, notre travail a été d'évaluer les conséquences des changements climatiques dans le Québec rural, des dommages causés par les tempêtes épisodiques aux effets de l'érosion chronique des rivages dans les villages le long du fleuve. Notre objectif est plus particulièrement de revaloriser les terres ainsi laissées à l'abandon par les communautés et de les transformer avec l'aide de la communauté locale en espace public, dynamique et vivant. Pour réussir à mieux vivre avec un littoral en transition, il faut changer notre façon de penser et se demander comment on pourrait façonner le rivage en utilisant et valorisant des forces vivantes de l'environnement immédiat plutôt que d'essayer de restaurer et de préserver des écologies fragiles existantes. Ce concept se traduit dans ce projet-ci par la création d'une série de jardins en sélectionnant de façon éthique, dans l'environnement immédiat, des espèces végétales ayant le potentiel de façonner l'environnement grâce à leur système racinaire. Ce projet mise donc sur l'extraordinaire capacité d'adaptation de certaines plantes de bord de mer qui, pour survivre à des conditions climatiques changeantes et extrêmes, fortifient leur système racinaire et conséquemment solidifient le sol sur lequel elles vivent. Ces jardins ne cherchent pas à éloigner les humains de la nature. Au contraire, nous voulons que les gens bénéficient de ces espaces privés récupérés qui redeviennent accessibles au grand public. Le jardin de bord de mer a pour but de transformer le rivage le long de l'estuaire du fleuve Saint-Laurent et de le renforcer face à un avenir incertain. Cette approche de la gestion du littoral diffère des travaux typiques contre l'érosion, car elle privilégie d'une part l'utilisation des plantes plutôt que des infrastructures traditionnelles de béton et d'acier, et d'autre part valorise la construction communautaire. Un des objectifs de ce projet est de s'éloigner de l'idée préconçue selon laquelle seules les structures de béton et d'acier sont résilientes à l'érosion. Ce projet mise au contraire sur les plantes comme infrastructure principale. En effet, les plantes ligneuses ajoutent de l'intégrité et stabilisent le sol. Plus ces plantes seront soumises à des changements climatiques sévères, plus elles fortifieront leurs racines qui deviendront ainsi un réseau dense et compact offrant une protection tout à fait comparable à celle du béton, mais bien supérieure en termes de longévité, en raison de leur nature vivante et de leur capacité à s'adapter. Les rhizomes s'étendront sous terre et développeront une forêt côtière partiellement souterraine. Cette écologie ligneuse se développera en une protection essentielle pour la route 132, en atténuant le vent et en capturant les débris, tout en offrant un site agréable pour des activités récréatives. Nous espérons que ce projet, qui vise à promouvoir la croissance d'infrastructures vertes qui ont la capacité d'être résilientes, deviendra un modèle d'adaptation pour de nombreux autres sites le long du littoral. Plusieurs plantes peuvent renforcer et solidifier le sol par leur système racinaire, mais pour ce projet, nous avons opté pour des plantes ligneuses locales, bien adaptées, connues par la communauté et déjà disponibles. Toutes les plantes utilisées dans les jardins ont été transplantées par la communauté qui, faisant partie intégrante du projet, se sentira plus impliquée également pour l'entretenir à long terme. En choisissant des plantes ayant une structure racinaire rhizomateuse et une haute tolérance au sel, le jardin de bord de mer et les futurs jardins deviennent un espace éducatif pour tester et démontrer l'importance critique des plantes dans la gestion d'un littoral en transition. Pour construire les jardins, des plantes ligneuses et des graminées ont été plantées le long des buttes faites avec des galets de plage. Ces buttes ont pour but d'aider à contrôler l'érosion et d'atténuer l'action des vagues, alors que la végétation aide à stabiliser le sol. Ce substrat sablonneux et poreux forme la base de cette écologie côtière composée de fourrés de buissons et de couvre-sols saisonniers. Tout au long du projet, nous avons priorisé l'utilisation des matériaux locaux trouvés ou donnés. Les buts sont faites à partir de galets de plage qui ont été déplacés du rivage vers une carrière pour faire place au développement résidentiel. Nous les ramenons donc à leur lieu d'origine. Quant aux plantes ligneuses, elles ont poussé dans les fossés le long des routes et ont été transplantées par l'équipe pour créer des bosquets le long du littoral. Finalement, les graminées ont été cultivées par les jardins de métis dans une pépinière côtière spécialisée dans les plantes tolérantes à la brume marine. L'autre composante importante du tissu côtier est la communauté qui habite ces paysages à risque. L'ampleur de l'érosion causée par le climat dans, ce, dans cette région encourage les communautés à travailler ensemble pour atténuer leurs propres risques climatiques. Cette initiative de jardin s'inscrit tout à fait dans cet effort communautaire local et contribue à la résilience régionale. En plus de sa capacité à protéger, le jardin de bord de mer établit un espace public peu coûteux, accessible, beau, facile à entretenir et qui peut donc être reproduit par les communautés le long de la route 132. Les communautés font partie intégrante du projet. 
En utilisant à notre avantage les particularités du paysage, ainsi qu'en impliquant et discutant avec la communauté dès le concept initial, le projet devient nécessairement un processus adaptif et continu dans le temps qui se réalise à travers de simples actes quotidiens de la communauté. On parle de co-design lorsque les membres de la communauté décident où et comment placer les pierres, les plantes et les sentiers. L'entretien est planifié par la communauté selon les cycles saisonniers afin que l'ensemble du site puisse devenir plus durable face aux vents forts et aux vagues érosives. Cette approche de conception, dirigée par la communauté, traite ses membres comme des collaborateurs égaux dans le processus de design et vise à établir un modèle communautaire de gestion des lieux à long terme. Cette implication renforce l'investissement communautaire et l'héritage pour les futures générations à travers la création de paysages où l'on se sent comme chez soi. En utilisant des méthodes basées sur une profonde compréhension du territoire, nous permettons aux citoyens de construire leur propre réseau de soutien pour faire face à un avenir incertain. Cette approche démontre comment l'implication de la communauté à long terme, les communications et le partage de certaines connaissances de base en aménagement peuvent contribuer à développer un littoral public, résilient et connecté à sa région. Tout au long du processus, nous avons travaillé avec des bénévoles enthousiastes de la municipalité, les avons impliqués directement dans la construction et la plantation des jardins de bord de mer. Cette expérience pratique permet d'approfondir la connexion de la communauté avec son littoral changeant en créant des souvenirs positifs et en suscitant de l'excitation quant aux possibilités futures. Un des buts du projet de jardin de bord de mer est d'encourager les divers intervenants, les propriétaires, résidents locaux, partenaires municipaux, organismes régionaux, à mettre en œuvre l'ensemble de ces façons de faire, adaptées à leur territoire, afin d'en arriver à une autonomie locale à long terme, tout en visant le partage et la contribution équitable de chacun des intervenants. Nous espérons que ce guide pratique permettra de partager l'information sur les manières de faire pour réduire les risques inhérents au changement climatique et de permettre ainsi aux citoyens de construire leur propre littoral public connecté régionalement. De plus, à travers le prisme de la narration de justice sociale, nous espérons reformuler les récits autour de la retraite due à l'érosion du rivage sous un angle d'espoir. Grâce aux fonds reçus de la Fondation d'architecture de paysage du Canada en 2023, nous avons pu continuer cette mission en réalisant un guide pratique disponible gratuitement. Ce guide explique comment faire pour gérer l'érosion du littoral en utilisant principalement la vie végétale. Plutôt que de partager un plan qui est copié-collé sur des sites ne tenant pas compte des conditions locales, ce manuel décrit les principes et les processus pour commencer votre propre jardin de bord de mer résilient. Voyez-le un peu comme une recette. Les ingrédients et les quantités changeront en fonction des conditions locales, mais les proportions et la saveur générale resteront les mêmes. Nous partageons une base à partir de laquelle peut être développée une conception adaptée pour chaque endroit. Les objectifs de la conception sont d'atténuer l'érosion, de développer un paysage peu coûteux et nécessitant très peu d'entretien, tout en créant un espace public accessible et agréable le long du littoral qui est de plus en plus sujet aux inondations et tempêtes saisonnières. Le design se concentre sur quelques ingrédients clés. Créer une topographie pour briser l'action des vagues et travailler avec les, les plantes et leurs racines, principalement des plantes ligneuses et, et rhizomateuses, pour maintenir le sol. Ce guide s'adresse à toutes les communautés à la recherche de moyens de gérer des terrains qui ne peuvent plus soutenir de logements permanents en paysage côtier. Plutôt que de voir ce retrait des côtes comme une perte, voyons-le comme une opportunité de développer un espace public qui agit simultanément comme une barrière de protection, une ressource communautaire et un habitat biodiversifié. En prenant le jardin de bord de mer comme étude de cas, nous partageons nos principes de conception, nos méthodes et valeurs dans l'espoir d'encourager les communautés à initier leur propre jardin résilient. Les trois grandes lignes directrices sont premièrement la conception avec la perturbation, c'est-à-dire d'accepter l'inévitabilité des changements et d'utiliser des matériaux capables de s'adapter comme les plantes ligneuses à racines en rhizome. Deuxièmement, d'utiliser les plantes comme partenaires en valorisant le comportement des plantes ligneuses spécifiques à la région, car elles sont adaptées aux vents et aux rivages changeants. Et troisièmement, la réutilisation de matériaux en créant avec des éléments déjà existants ou donnés. La réutilisation de matériaux permet d'économiser et de réduire l'empreinte carbone du projet. Ce guide pratique « How to grow a shoreline » combine l'adaptation climatique et la conservation des terres en établissant une approche simple pour s'ajuster au changement. Le co-design agrandit le domaine public, encourage la protection du littoral à l'échelle résidentielle et régionale et utilise le design pour rassembler les communautés. 
À travers cette collaboration, nous offrons aux communautés l'opportunité d'explorer les relations entre l'érosion du littoral et les limites de l'implantation côtière. À partir de notre expérience et du succès des projets pilotes des jardins de bord de mer, la retraite des terres peut signifier la restauration des relations entre les plantes, les personnes et les lieux. La résilience climatique n'appartient pas qu'à une discipline, une expérience ou une politique unique et peut, avec un peu de bonne volonté, rassembler les communautés de manière à honorer la connectivité de nos cultures et écologies régionales. Merci d'avoir écouté. Um, uh, thanks for listening. I'm just going to share in the chat. Um, I see that the handbook was shared the, for the web version, and I'll show the print version also, as well as uh, the landscape of retreat book. Here. Thank you so much, Catherine. Merci beaucoup, Catherine. En effet, c'est vraiment intéressant comme projet. Euh, je pense qu'on on voit qu'il y a un thème aujourd'hui, c'est être à l'écoute, euh, s'impliquer aux communautés euh, et que les communautés sont vraiment intégrales au travail euh, de l'architecte paysagiste. Euh, il y a une question ici de Nathalie. Euh, elle veut savoir, y a-t-il un œil pour l'habitat aquatique avec le choix de plantes? Euh, le choix des plantes, euh, on n'a on pas, pas focusé sur euh, les, des algues ou des plantes marines. Par contre, c'est toutes des plantes qui ont, sont adaptées au vent et au, à l'air euh, sal, euh, euh, sal, salé, de, à, au vent salé, qui, pardon, <rire> qui sont, euh, sont dans les conditions de, de bord de fleuve euh, dans le Bas-Saint-Laurent. Mais c est, c est, ce site-là va être le futur rivage, donc... On, on prend en compte la, la transition euh, dans, le, dans le design. Merci beaucoup. Présentation très intéressante. I encourage everybody to uh, pop onto the LACF website um, and uh, click those links in the chat as well to learn more uh, about uh, the work that Catherine's been doing. Thank you very much, Catherine. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Our next uh, presentation uh, is by Corey Dawson. Um, and Corey, I will leave it to you, your presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Corey Dawson and I'll be presenting the early stages of a research project titled Using River Builder as a Tool for Riverscape Design and Flood Risk Management, a case study for Sackville River in Nova Scotia. Uh, this was provided through funding in the LACF Award and the Sustainable Buildings Canada Grant. I'll start with the purpose of the research and project location, some flooding issues, introduce our nature-based solution to Riverscape Restoration and the River Builder software that was used, uh, propose some design scenarios and go through some of the topographic and hydraulic analysis that we've completed, as well as the next steps for the project. The purpose of the research is to propose an interdisciplinary approach to riverscape restoration planning by using synthetic 3D surfaces for quantifying and communicating design decisions for nature-based solutions. Uh, to do this by evaluating grading and planting design scenarios for a real-world site and allows for landscape architects to provide interactive digital environments for community outreach and to communicate to the public um, through an interactive environment. The site uh, that we're looking at is in Bedford, Nova Scotia. It's upstream from the Bedford Bay. Uh, so this is the Bedford Place Mall and it's adjacent to the Sackville River uh, shown right here. The problem with the site, uh, it's, it was built on a floodplain. It has a confined river channel, which is the Sackville River. It's mostly impervious and it has three bridge crossings. Uh, so it's difficult to actually do any restoration on this site. Uh, and just last year, there was one of a few major floodings in the area uh, in July. Uh, you can see here on the hydrograph, this peak in discharge and water level, uh, which is potentially going to be more and more of a concern with the impacts of climate change. 
So we decided to look upstream to an existing site. Right now it's a national rifle range. Uh, it has cleared forest and a straightened channel. Um, and we're going to conceptually restore this site uh, to go through how this type of approach uh, can be implemented. Um, luckily, the province has high resolution LIDAR for most of the province, uh, which allows this existing surface to be compared with our proposed designs. Uh, and the objectives, the main objectives of the design is to increase water storage on this upstream site and decrease flow velocity to thereby attempt to reduce peak discharge downstream and reduce the impact of future flooding at the Bedford Place Mall. So our approach to river restoration, um, conventionally restoration projects are defined as form-based, largely in North America. Uh, many of them follow the natural channel design method. Uh, many of the projects are driven by stability objectives, mainly in urbanized areas, uh, which create static or rigid channels. They use hardscape structures for bed and bank protection, uh, but they also result in symmetrical meander patterns, uh, sequential pool riffle sequences, and an overall simplification of naturally dynamic channels. Uh, so in this image on the left, this is a channel that was defined as degraded. It's the Highland Creek in Toronto. And what you often see is this simplification through restoration um, on the right side uh, with these more symmetrical meanders and these evenly spaced pool riffle sequences. Um, so it's simplifying a very complex uh, river channel by design. In the fluvial geomorphology literature, there's a large push for what's called process-based restoration, which can be thought of as a component of nature-based solutions. Uh, the idea is to recreate the dynamic process form linkages so rivers can behave more naturally. Uh, it allows streams to adjust to future changes in the system with resilience to disturbance. So changes in flow regime, the channel can adjust vertically and horizontally um, through those changes. And it, it's an overall attempt to design for a more natural geomorphic, ecological, and hydraulic complexity uh, so these rivers can behave more naturally. Uh, some issues with process-based restoration is that natural complexity, once it gets too wild, it becomes perceived as messy, abandoned, or unsafe. So it's a landscape that appears to need maintenance. Uh, it also requires space for movement, so deposition and erosion, uh, which is sometimes difficult in urbanized areas. And it's difficult to quantify um, some elements in the design phase uh, because the services aren't created yet to make those comparisons before it's actually constructed. So in many design briefs, they'll include things like enhanced habitat quality and floodplain connectivity, but it's difficult to actually quantify that uh, before actual implementation. Uh, so there are many disciplines or experts within a restoration project. Essentially, the ecologist and fluvial geomorphologist want to restore as much complexity as possible, uh, but the community and public and hydraulic engineers don't want too much complexity. So I believe landscape architects are well suited and skilled to balance these diverse objectives um, and reach the aesthetic ecosystem and stability goals uh, through the design planning process. And one way to do that uh, is using River Builder software. The River Builder is very interesting. Uh, it creates 3D digital surfaces that are based in principles in fluvial geomorphology. Uh, so for example, fundamentally along the outside of meander bends, velocity is higher. So you'll get more erosion and you'll develop these pool forms, so concave forms, uh, compared to the inside of meander bends where flow is fundamentally lower and it creates deposition and bars to develop. Uh, so the software takes input scripts and adjusts the channel based on those fundamental process form relationships. So you can systematically adjust the channel and it will then um, change the morphological feature, feature configurations uh, through those process form linkages. 
So it's beyond simply putting inputs to a script and creating a channel. It's actually using the process relationships uh, to drive these channel forms. This is an example of a river builder script. It looks much more complicated than it actually is. Uh, after a couple of runs, it's very user friendly. Um, you start off with domain parameters uh, and channel cross-section values. Uh, you then can apply these user-defined functions. So there are a number of these. Uh, basically, there's infinite amount of combinations you can use uh, to adjust these channels through the process. The, uh, the main values that you input uh, for A, this is the amplitude, so that is either vertical, um, how high a river bed feature will be, um, and the variation of that, or the amplitude of a meander bend, so how wide a meander is, as well as F is for the frequency, so how frequent these meander bends or river features are going to occur within your designed channel. These are some examples of just the progression of adding more user-defined inputs. So you can start with a straight channel. Uh, you get a bit of meander bend within that channel. You can increase the frequency of these meander bends, uh, as well as the amplitude, and then start adding some more combinations to increase the regularity and complexity of these river builder-defined channels. So the idea here is to take the existing uh, topographic survey. Uh, so this is the rifle range. This is our site uh, with the existing channel in it. Uh, we implement a river builder channel uh, based on user defined inputs. And then in Civil 3D, um, or in yes, yeah, Civil 3D, we implement these contour maps uh, and mesh them together. So this is the river builder channel. Uh, we can then adjust the grading around the channel to create this new design surface uh, that we can then compare with the existing through the planning phase. So we completed three design scenarios. The first was a conventional natural channel design approach. So we re-meandered the channel, increased the width, which is a common uh, approach to reduce flow velocity. Um, we have implemented, oops, some symmetrical planform patterns, sequential pool riffles, and added some storage. So this is the river builder channel here. We've implemented some storage ponds uh, within the landscape. Our scenario two is what we're calling a wetland approach. Also re-meander the channel with more variable widths uh, and an irregular plan form with irregular bed features. We've also had some ponds for storage um, and a wetland that we've implemented here, as well as some geomorphic relics such as an oxbow lake. Uh, so the idea here was to implement this channel first into the floodplain and understand the, those process form relationships. Um, so theoretically, uh, a meander may have been here that was cut off uh, previously to create what are called oxbow lakes. Um, areas along the outside of meander bends where flow is higher in velocity, there's more likely to erode. Um, so we can provide some more room here for future migration within the channel because process-based restoration, we want to encourage that movement. Uh, this isn't a static design. And then finally, scenario three is a multi-thread channel. Uh, a similar approach, uh, but we replace the wetland with side channels, uh, which are also created in River Builder uh, and meshed together in Civil 3D. And we also have some gentle floodplain forms here to provide sediment as these channels migrate through time. Uh, so based on our existing uh, DEM, we now have three design scenarios that we can then do some quantitative analysis on. Uh, the first thing we looked at was this flood polygon that we brought into GIS at four meter water level. Uh, we could look at the water storage comparisons between our design scenarios, and we can compare that with a very quick cut and fill analysis uh, to see how much cut is required to reach this amount of water storage on site. 
uh, thereby reducing theoretically the water that would be traveling down site to the Bedford, Bedford Place Mall. Uh, we also did some geomorphic analysis, so the variety values of aspect planform curvature and flow direction can also be compared between the designs as well as comparing it to the existing site. We can bring these channels into uh, software such as HECRAFS to do some hydraulic analysis, uh, complete some spatial and statistical flow velocity comparisons. We can do flood extent comparisons as well as peak discharge calculations. Uh, so scenario here has a, a lower mean flow velocity, but we can start to understand exactly um, in scenario two here where velocity is higher and we can make adjustments to our designs uh, based on these quantified variables through the process. The next steps for the process or for the project, uh, we're going to be applying the geomorphic unit tool to derive some gut maps. Uh, this is a semi-automated application that maps out um, geomorphic units that are important ecologically, so riffles, pools, and bars. Uh, once we have these maps, we can then compare scenarios with additional metrics, such as the Shannon's diversity index, uh, unit type dominance, and unit shape complexity, amongst others, to then get some more quantified ecological landscape values. Uh, through funding through the LACF, uh, I was also able to hire a landscape architecture student. Um, I'm going to be getting him, Ian Logan, to do some planting designs for these scenarios so we can look at additional things such as runoff, canopy cover, and interception, um, as well as absorption. And we'll also be applying a rainfall intensity tool which has been cal calibrated for climate change. And finally, we're gonna be converting these grading and planting designs into a 3D model, possibly SketchUp, uh, to provide some interactive surfaces uh, some fly-through videos and some V-Ray renderings that can be used for community outreach or for public aesthetic evaluation. Uh, in conclusion, this is the workflow uh, of the process, starting first with the field work um, to get the existing topography, uh, create three design scenarios, do some analytical testing and adjustments, uh, bring these to the community and the public for aesthetic evaluation, select a proposed design which can then be constructed and appraised uh, five to ten years after. River Builder provides a novel approach for nature-based solutions um, for riverscape restoration from process-based linkages. Uh, synthetic 3D digital surfaces provide an interdisciplinary medium for quantifying and communicating design scenarios and landscape architects are well suited for bridging the decision-making gap between fluvial geomorphologists, ecologists, hydraulic engineers, and the public. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. Goodness, I can't think of a better use for LACF uh, research funding uh, than this kind of work. I, I think the applications, there's just so many applications for this kind of technology. So uh, well done. Um, please thank a reminder you. to send in if you have any questions um, for Corey. Um, but thank you for this great presentation. Um, I guess my question is the practical one. Um, um, how, what's the timeline on this tool and, and how will you kind of get this out into practice and make this available to, to the landscape architects? Um, that's my you know, question is really, this is so valuable. Um, what can we do to get it out there? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so the River Middle tool is available now for free. So it was developed by uh, Gregory Pasternak and Rocco Brown. Um, so there is a manual on there. It's a bit difficult at the very beginning, but you don't need to know how to code or anything. It is pretty user friendly. Um, but as I was working with it, so I was using it for river restoration. That's what I did, um, or that's what I do my research in mainly, but it could be even a tool just for small scale bioswale designs. Uh, I can calculate the discharge that you need for a swale. Um, so it does have other applications, but it is available online if you have ArcGIS currently. 
perfect, Corey. Make sure to share that uh, website in the chat uh, so that uh, sure. everybody can access it. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment, um, but if we get some by email, we'll be sure to forward them to you, Corey. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. And the final presentation of the day is by um, another Corey Douglas this time um, and Christina Zaleid, who is the uh, first recipient of the uh, Robert A. Alsup Urban Design Fellowship, um, again by LACF. Um, so lots of great work coming out of the foundation being featured by CSLA and Mala at our Congresses. Uh, I will leave it to the last presentation and uh, we'll have some a little bit of time at the end for questions as well. Hi, I'm Christina Zalit. I'm a landscape architect and the principal at Zala Design, and I'm joining you from the stolen, unceded lands of Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples in Vancouver, BC. In the Hulkamanum language, I may be called a Hylitum Slili, which is a white European lady because my family and ancestral cultures are rooted in Latvia, Norway, and in England. Hi, Christina. My name is Corey Douglas. Uh, I'm a Squamish Nation member. Um, I am acting as a cultural consultant on this particular project, but I'm also a cultural consultant uh, in the industry. Uh, I have an architectural engineering background uh, and, and, and I'm also an artist. Thank you for having me today. And thanks to the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects for inviting us to share some research that we've been doing. Uh, along with Ron Hart Architecture and Prospect and Refuge Landscape Architects, we extended a design project into the realm of research. Our research methods use interviews, literature review, and methods such as group story and reflections that we learned from Sean Wilson's book, Research is Ceremony. The findings in our research are embedded in the following discussion, which is a question and answer format. And we find that this is a really appropriate way to engage you uh, in the subject of our research and our thoughts around evolving the design process. The next slide, please. So we have a project site that's on unceded Matsqui and Samath First Nation land. It's in the Coast Salish territory of BC. The site's surrounded by industrial and commercial development, railroad tracks and fences and other clear signifiers of colonization. It's adjacent to a regularly inundated floodplain and channelized water course, eventually connecting to the beautiful Fraser River and leading out to the Salish Sea. Next slide. So the site is in the city of Abbotsford and our client BC Housing will build a supportive housing project. And the premise of the design goal for us consultants is that in providing culturally meaningful experiences for the majority Indigenous population who will be living here in this home. The site can also be a meaningful and healing home for all of the residents who live in this shared space. Next slide. So I'd like to start with a background story uh, from Corey Douglas about how you came to be involved in this project. Can you tell us about your advisory consulting and how your advisory consulting became part of this particular project and how you worked with the consulting team? That's a really good question. Uh, and it's a question that I, I try and do my best to answer uh, in participation of my propositioning to be a cultural consultant on uh, even projects today. Um, cultural consulting is a, is a relatively new uh, <clears throat> profession in the industry. Um, we're trying to, and I say we, I'll share a little bit more about some of my colleagues in the industry, but we're trying to normalize this as part of a, a deeper level of engagement um, and, and trying to better understand what is culturally appropriate. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that a little, maybe a little bit later as well. So, you know, 
it was a it was a pretty complex process, you know, trying to understand and appreciate uh, scheduling, deliverables, fee structure, um, you know, anything that's relative to to industry standard practices with respect to all disciplines on a project. So I was trying to do my very best to navigate through all of that and ensure that I'm covering uh, a lot of my needs as a as a consultant. And uh, this is like maybe one of the first projects of you know me kind of uh, you know I guess getting a better understanding and impression of uh, how to incorporate myself into this type of project. So Ron Hart and I had sat down and extensively outlined exactly what the deliverables would be. And kind of like a rough schedule um, and, and assign a, an appropriately monetary value, basically an hourly rate. Um, again, this this uh, position that I hold is um, relatively new to the industry and there's very few of us that are actually providing this as a high level of service to a project of our scale. And I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but I'm trying to give you a, a better sense. Thanks. As um, landscape architects, we almost always work in consulting teams, but sometimes we still feel like, I still feel like we're working quite independently in silos. And we learn that dividing up things is a pretty colonial construct, similar to the Canadian settler colonial project, dividing up landscape and building ideology that separates us from nature and from each other. And knowing that this is the historical context that we work in, where do you see yourself in the design team? And how do you work across different disciplines? You know, this this is a really exciting question for me. Um, you know, as, a, as an independent cultural consultant, uh, I'm generally only, sometimes I'm the only Indigenous person in the room. So, you know, the, the, the hard reality is that most people view me as the person to provide high levels of a guidance and or uh, I, I guess I'm going to call them cultural contribution initiatives to the overall project itself, when in fact it should be a shared responsibility. And I think this is where it becomes really exciting for me is to encourage people to find a level of comfort uh, in committing their own efforts to truth and reconciliation. If you look at the industry, the industry has played a significant role in the erasure of our visibility in our in our own traditional territories, and that falls back on all disciplines of a project. So you know, and and I don't mean that in any disrespectful way at, at all. I think this is a moment of encouragement, and I think we are all really inspired to try and do something a little different. Let's let's change our day just a little bit differently and and um, if, again, find that moment of encouragement. And that's what I try and inspire uh, with my team members. And to your point, this is not a siloed uh, effort. This is a collaborative effort. And and uh, really that's kind of the first step um, towards, you know, a high levels of creative creativity being applied to truth and reconciliation with respect to revitalizing visibility, uh, cultural visibility in one's traditional territory. So speaking of visibility, the site and the building design have some things that we've called placeholders. Can mm. you tell us what they're holding space for? Yeah, and uh, you have some great questions. This is wonderful. Um, placeholders, uh, I am a guest in Sumas and, and Matt Squee's traditional territory. Uh, just like the rest of our team, including BC Housing, and, and most of the, the community uh, of, of Abbotsford. So uh, I, I try and, again, fall back on moments of visibility in the overall project. So um, Matsqui, uh, Squamish Nation, Musqueam, uh, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, uh, just to name a few, are, are part of a, a broader range of uh, of Coast Salish communities. So for the most part, we practice similar uh, art form, a similar art form being Coast Salish art form. So uh, being a, a Coast Salish artist and revitalizing Coast Salish art, 
uh, I've taken from my own personal library of artwork and applied it to our project. Knowing that this is Matsqui and Sumas traditional territory, uh, I would never um, assume that I could apply my work uh, and, and as a Squamish Nation member, inform the team uh, from a Squamish Nation's perspective of what would be culturally appropriate and or even respectful of Sumas and Matsqui. This is a term of reference called protocol. So I'm creating these spaces in our project for a much deeper level of engagement with community members from Matsqui and Sumas. So uh, whoever we uh, contract, and I mean, that's a crazy term as well, whoever we uh, assign a contract to uh, in participation of this project, those placeholders will be uh, uh, worked on by said artists or community members in support of um, a, a moment of history or a legend uh, that they could share with our team. Hence placeholder. Great. Uh, could you share with us some of the ways where we were not able to move into new spaces of decolonizing or or new imagined places and how you'd love to see this go could go even further the and another great question um there there's a there's a term of reference that um my my project partner and i are using uh when describing these types of placeholders or or um on a project and uh, we call them cultural contributions. So what what are other levels of cultural contributions that uh, we didn't quite hit, hit with this? And granted, uh, this was very early in, in my career as a cultural consultant. And keep in mind, I, I've only been a cultural consultant for four years. So I've been only providing this level of service for four years, but the growth has been exponential. Um, as I had mentioned, I have an architectural and engineering background in public art, so I was able to, you know, at least uh, introduce a new process here. So uh, I was also learning just like our team, and I've learned a lot since this project. Again, trying to find moments that I can describe a much deeper level of engagement. Um, we did what we could with the knowledge that we had had and um, falling back on public art is, is a common contribution. And I, I'm not dismissing it in any way. It's a fundamental foundation to support an indigenous community. Um, and our arts, uh, our arts community with respect to each indiv individual nation is quite extensive as well. So, um, I, I think that bringing language would have been an additional, call it resource that could be utilized. Um, history of place. Uh, what, what was the history uh, of our site? Uh, would have been a great uh, moment for us to celebrate Matsqui and, and Sumas's uh, pre-colonial history uh, of, of this region. Um, were there any villages nearby? Uh, what kind of gathering? Uh, what kind of resources uh, uh, were, were supporting the communities? Um, we call them legends, but uh, they're, they're, they're traditional stories. You know, what kind of traditional stories uh, were shared between the two of them? Um, what were the relationships between Matsqui and Sumas? Um, you know, the, these are kinds of examples that would, uh, of, of a deeper level of engagement with respect to both nations that would have potentially helped facilitate our team's um, response to all of that information to inform us of potentially some new ideas with respect to architectural and landscape expression. So, and I'm just sharing a few examples, um, but uh, those those are examples that come immediately to mind for me. 
Thanks, Corey. Um, in closing, uh, let, let's go to the last slide and let you know that in a month or so, we'll be launching a full report uh, for this research, and we'd love to share it with you. So please email us. Um, we have a great list of references about decolonizing specifically for designers. Um, and we can also uh, would be happy to receive comments, questions, or or just conversations around decolonizing the design process. In closing, thanks for taking time out of your day to think about ways to decolonize design. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Corey. Thank you so much, Christina and Corey. Uh, what a fascinating profession um, as a cultural consultant. Um, I, I think that's um, one of the questions I had um, for you, Corey, um, specifically was, um, you know, wondering if you worked as a sub consultant or um, did you work directly for the nation, um, the host nation, and really what is kind of the ideal? Like, how do you insert uh, yourself and what's the best way of doing that? Um, your, that kind of function that you do, um, what is the, the most ideal relationship? Uh, I, I wonder about that and if you might speak to that point. We're seeing more. Thank you, Michelle. Um, there, there are opportunities uh, where I am actively uh, sought out to work with nations. Um, more recently here with Squamish Nation, the nation I, I belong to, uh, I, I was asked to participate in a land use study. Um, I, I generally work as, a, as an independent, independent cultural consultant. So I'm generally a good, a sub consultant to um, either the architect or the landscape architect. But um, communities are taking it up upon themselves to develop their own strategies on um, on their own development initiatives. So it's quite exciting. And this is a new position in the industry and we're trying to do our best to support it as, as best as we can. And obviously a position that's very well needed, uh, very much uh, in demand. So uh, thank you both very much. Um, that was really interesting. Christina, we're going to be looking forward to seeing the work that's going to come out of your uh, LACF fellowship um, next year um, and the year after. Um, and we want to thank you both and to thank everybody who presented here today and who participated um, in this event. Of course, the recording will be available. Um, we will be posting it and to the CSLA's YouTube website shortly with a link from the CSLA website. Merci beaucoup tout le monde d'avoir été parmi nous aujourd'hui. Uh, la vidéo bientôt sera uh, disponible sur le site web de l'APC et le post YouTube de l'APC. So thank you very much everybody um, for this uh, wonderful afternoon of presentations. Uh, it really, um, it really was fascinating. Much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>